Shakti Pod Seer 2. Om. That is whole. This is whole. From the whole, the whole becomes manifest. Take away the whole from the whole, and the whole remains. Om. Peace. 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 We are told by almost all esoteric traditions on the planet that, quote-unquote, as above, so below. In other words, that the microcosm represented by man is in the exact same image as the macrocosm represented by God. This principle is the same as how a tree imparts its entire blueprint into a seed, and from that small seed, another entire tree can grow. Just as goes the famous introduction to the Sri Isha Upanishad. Om, that is whole, this is whole. From the whole, the whole becomes manifest. Take away the whole from the whole, and the whole remains. Om, peace, peace, peace. If we take the ancient adages to be true, that man is truly in the image of the great man, the Adam Kadman, the Adi Purusham, etc., the God, then it follows that at our core there is a seed of life which has been imparted to us from our Creator, from which we have grown into His, Her image, the great tree of life. Vaishnava philosophy, the original Godhead is a male and female couple, Radha Krishna, representing the supreme predominated and predominating deity, as related in the Sri Brahma Samhita. The super excellent station of Krishna, which is known as Gokul, has thousands of petals and a corolla like that of a lotus sprouted from a part of his infinitary aspect, the whirl of the leaves being the actual abode of Krishna. The whirl of that transcendental lotus is the realm wherein dwells Krishna. It is a hexagonal figure, the abode of the indwelling, predominated and predominating aspects of the Absolute. Like a diamond, the central supporting figure of self-luminous Krishna stands as the transcendental source of all potencies. The holy name consisting of 18 transcendental letters is manifest in a hexagonal figure with six-fold divisions. Thus it follows that as per the adage, as above, so below, the transcendental seed or heart of our life is in the nature of mantra power, or specialized vibration. It is a whirling lotus flower, and it is divided into a star tetrahedron, hexagonal shape, with predominated triangles and predominating triangles. This is a symbol which is called the seed of life. It appears around the internet a lot nowadays due to its exposure by people such as Drunvala Melchizedek to the New Age public eye. This is a geometric representation, in light I would add, of a vibrational field. 
we know that each of the four elements emerges from the previous. Earth is contracted from water. Water, in other words, contracts ten times to form earth. Fire contracts to form water. Air contracts itself ten times to form fire. And eventually, the ultimate element is ether, akash, space. The actual tattva of akash, or sound, is the perfect vibrational carrier for all other forms of non-audible vibration that manifest eventually as the elements of the body and the material world. As it is often said in esoteric texts such as the Kabbalion, everything is vibration. One of their seven principles is that everything moves, nothing is at rest, everything is constantly vibrating. So this vibration is one supreme sound. The sacred pattern of the seed of life is the geometric expression or representation of the seed of the vibration God himself, the omnipotent, all-sustaining, creating, destroying, conscious power, consciousness, expressed through sound, Shabda Brahman. Do you see what this is saying? The Supreme Personality of Godhead, God, Krishna, who is the very first and primal Purusha, the Adi Purusha, the Adam Kadman, the Supreme Male, who is the very first subject of any sentence, the very first in the creation of any universe, the original, all-encompassing consciousness with his original, all-encompassing power, the original Atman Prakriti, are united within all things. They are extending their energy, their consciousness, into all energy and consciousness. They are at the very center of the toroidal field. dynamics are visible at various scales. One of them is at the galactic level, which are huge spinning structures with billions of stars in it. Looks like typically big arms of galaxies spinning around and they have vortices that goes from the center out to the edge of the galactic halo that surrounds them. Stars move from this galactic disk out to the halo, down the vortices, and back out again. Stars like Arcturus, for instance, we know, have done that path already. That's the appropriate description even for the atmosphere of our planet, the weather goes from the North Pole down to the equator and then back up, from the South Pole up to the equator and then back down. Even the dynamics on the surface of the Sun are very similar. Of course, here we're looking at it from an external perspective on a small scale model. When you look at the solar system embedded in the galaxy, embedded in the cluster, embedded in the supercluster, we're traveling in this boundless sea of infinite Taurus flow. See, if I took this double Taurus and I took a picture of it, 
at the right angle, it would look like two spheres intersecting as well. These are the dynamics of the, the, uh, of the standing waves of the surface of the black hole of the double torus predicted by this theory. And here you can see the expansion and contracting side of the universe dynamics. And this is the path of a test particle on the surface of such a black hole. This is the dynamics of the Coriolis effect. On the Earth, you find the same Coriolis effect. For instance, the weather has, you know, go uh, the 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 patterns of the weather goes down to the equator, gets hotter, and then goes back up to the North Pole and back down towards the equator, and so on. And the one uh, from the South Pole goes from the South Pole to the equator and back down, creating this exact dynamic. And uh, I thought it was interesting, although I didn't mention it at the APS, that the view of these dynamics from above is a yin and a yang. What is the undifferentiated singularity? at the core of the yin-yang dual torus field, in the pericarp of the lotus flower. In the very center of the human organism, we find the Hridaya Padma Chakra, the dweller of the lotus of the heart chakra, of which it is stated in the Brahmopanishad, all deities, all pranavayus and prana and the divine light are in the Hrid Chakra. All these are in the heart, which is in the nature of consciousness. And in the Gita Sara, it is stated, the Hri Lotus has eight petals. Inside the pericarp is the sun. Inside the sun is the moon. Inside the moon is fire. And inside fire is radiance, where a seat is located, which is ornamented with jewels, which is very bright. On this seat, God Narayan is sitting. In the Ridantil Tantra, it is stated, The Hri Chakra, which is within the Anahata, is of golden color, and there is the celestial wishing tree, Kalpataru, shining red in the pericarp, and at the base of the tree is a gem seat. This imagery will resonate with anyone familiar with Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy as we often hear the statement quoted from the Chaitanya Charitamrita. In a temple of jewels in Vrindavan, under a desire tree, Sri Sri Radha Govinda, served by their most confidential associates, sit upon an effulgent throne. I offer my humble obeisances to them. In the Brahma Vaivartha Upanishad, it is stated, Brahma saw Krishna exteriorly in the same form which he had seen him in the Hridayam Bhoj, the Hrit Padma, Hrit Lotus, and that one should concentrate on the all-pervading, perfectly pure being within the hollow of the Hrit Padma. The Garuda Purana confirms that, quote-unquote, the Atma, the Self, is situated in the Hrit Padma, Atma Prabhodu Upanishad also states, Atma is within the golden lotus, Hima Pundarik. King Pundarik, inter interestingly, was someone who dressed up like Krishna and claimed to be him during his pastimes in Braj. Elsewhere, this center is also called the Rit Pundarik, translated as heart lotus. In the Sri Gopal Tapani Upanishad, it is confirmed that the Dhyan form of Narayan as Krishna is within the quote-unquote fully blown eight-petaled lotus. In the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, it is stated, From Atman, undifferentiated self, arise all pranas, all lokas, all devas, all bhutas, that is, elements. The secret name of Atman is the truth of all truths. The pranas are the truth, but Atman is the truth of all truths. 
In the Narayan Upanishad, it is clearly stated that the Hridaya, which is like the bud of a lotus and its face turned downwards, in relation to it lies an infinitesimal void, Shukshma Shushira, where is situated the whole. Where is situated the whole. Within that lies the great fire, Mahan Agni, with its all pervading flame and its power on every side. Its rays are emanated upwards, downwards, and obliquely. Within it is a very minute fire flame, Vainishika, which, is, which shines like lightning in the blue sky and is lightly yellow and subtle. Within this flame is the Supreme Spirit. He is Brahma, Shiva, Hari, Indra. He is the imperishable Supreme God. The Hridaya is like a lotus, that is, it is the Hrit lotus or chakra which ordinarily lies with its head downwards. The chakra turns upwards during concentration. There is a void in relation to the Hrit lotus. The void is subtle, that is, it does not exist in a material sense. Here the whole chakra system is situated. This void is the Shushumna, within which lie the chakras including the Hrit Chakra. The center of the heart is the heart of all things. The center of the heart is the heart of all things. The center of the heart is the heart of all things. The From the point of undifferentiated Atman within the Hridaya Chakra emerges the central support of the organism in the form of the Shushumna Nadi, which extends through the very center of the spinal column from the root chakra to the crown. Yoga Shikshopanishad says, There are 101 Nadis in relation to the Hridaya Chakra. Of the 101 Nadis, one is the Shushumna, which is the highest. Within the Shushumna is concealed the Nadi, which is in the form of Brahman. That is the Brahman Nadi. This alone is pure in character. The Aida is situated on the left side and the Pingala is situated on the right side. Between these two is the most excellent position where the Shushumna is located. One who knows this is the knower of the Vedas. It also says that the Shushumna is the support of all the Nadis, which are in all parts and spread in all directions. There are 72,000 Nadis along which Vayu, pranic energy, operates. And that all of the Nadis originate from the central part of the Shushumna, where they ramify upwards, downwards, and obliquely. This is called the Nabi Chakra which is like a plexus the size of a hen's egg. Therefrom arise the Gantarian Hastijwa, which pass to the eyes, and the Pusha and Alambusha, which go through the ears, and the great Nadi Shura, to the space between the eyebrows. That Nadi called Vishwudhari is concerned with the digestion of the four kinds of food, and Saraswati Nadi extends to the tongue. Raka Nadi causes thirst, sneezing, and phlegm in the nostrils, etc etc. In order to allow, create, and regulate all functions of life and creation. The Vara Upanishad states, the Nadi Kanda, the central plexus of the Nadis, is located nine digit lengths above the genitals. There lies the twelve spoke Nadi Chakra, the Nadi system, which supports the body. In Nadi Chakra lies Kundalini, who has kept concealed the Brahma Randra, which is to be reached through the Shushumna, that is the crown chakra. The Nadi Chakra is formed of innumerable Nadis, which are arranged in plexus-like formation, having 12 spokes. The Nadis arise from the spokes, and they are also between the spokes. The Nadis are essentially the subtle lines of pranic force motions and are of different colors. Of all nadis, 14 are most important, and of the 14, 3 are most important. 
They are the Aida, Pingala, and Shushumna. Of these Nadis, the Shushumna is the greatest. The Shushumna is the central part of the Nadi system. It is within the vertebral column and extends from the Muladhara to the Brahmarandra in the head. Inside the Shushumna lies the Brahma Nadi. The Aida and Pingala are situated on the left and the right side of the Shushumna respectively. In Shandali Upanishad, it is stated, There in the Nadi Chakra is the Shushumna, which is known as the bearer of cosmic principles. That is, there are the various centers of cosmic principles within the Shushumna, and the means to liberation when the centers are absorbed in Kundalini. It, Shushumna, dwells in the vertebral column and extends from the back of the anal region to the head, where is the Brahmarandra. This subtle divine Nadi is manifested there. The Aida is situated on the left side of the Shushumna and the Pingala on the right side. It has been stated, Body is of two kinds, gross material and subtle extra material. The material body is composed of flesh, bone, hair, blood, fat, and marrow, excretes urine and discharges feces, and is endowed with vital activities, vata, and undergoes metabolism, pitta. The subtle body is composed of nadis, force motion lines, in which Ida is that nadi, which is moon white and situated on the left side, and Pingala is like the sun and masculine, and between the two nadis is Shushumna, containing the Brahma nadi. Shushumna is extremely fine and, turning from right to left, extends from Muladhar to Brahmaranda. Bhuta Shri Tantra, chapter 6, page 5. From this it is clear that the nadi system belongs to the subtle body. It is not a part of the material body. The chakras are within the Shushumna nadi. So it is said, inside it, Shushumna, is the extremely subtle Chitrini Nadi, which is divine in character and is in the form of letters, Matrika units, and in which are strung the six chakras. Samohana Tantra, page uh, 2, chapter 6. More clearly, inside the Shushumna is the shining Nadi named Vajra, and inside it is the subtle Chitrini through which Kundali passes. The beautiful six lotuses chakras are in this nadi. The chakras are subtle centers within the innermost force line of Shushumna. They do not belong to the material body and therefore they are not seen. The material body is the effect of the metamorphosis of the basic energy which is made to operate on the surface stratum due to the influence of prana force. That basic energy is entirely matter-free and active in the substratum, but is endowed with a specific quality which, under certain condition, gives it inertial character. This basic energy exhibits a circular wave motion which is reducible to a subtle infinitesimal point. This energy pattern is the Tan Mantra Mahabhuta forces, which exist in five forms. The fifth Mahabhuta, Prithivi, the earth metamatter, that is the matter of the matter. Force on the surface stratum exhibits its inertial quality, and as a result, energy appears in a conjugated form, that is, energy particles but energy may appear also as free from particles. Here the Prithivi factor becomes latent and the Tehas fire metamatter factor patent. Under this condition, energy appears as thermal, luminous, or electrical. In the energy transformation, the Ap water metamatter factor plays an important role and is associated with the chemical form of energy and energy as waves. The Tan Matra Mahabhuta metamatter forces create inorganic matter in which the influence of prana force plays a most important role. Prana force appearing as Vayu force 
operates in relation to Tanmatra Mahabhuta forces to create living matter. The creation of a living organized body is impossible without the Vayu forces being involved in the combination uh, with basic Tanmatra Mahabhuta metamatter forces of the five elements. Space, supposed to have been created about 13 billion years ago, is a boundless region of the infinite consisting of the unlimited and incalculable dimensional realm of our cosmos. This continuous expanse, extending in all directions, contains all the... of air as the sound is carried by the wind bringing life to music as it blows air is the breath of life the joys of clear communication and the sharpness of a quick intellect it is the truth that dwells within our spirits who among the wise can tell the mind of the wind consuming fury. Fire is hailed as an important element in Hindu mythology, Chinese Feng Shui, Native American lore, and Western pagan traditions. Tamasoma Jyotir Kamaya. Lead me from darkness to light. Ever see a droplet slither across a window pane? Or the tap dance of the rain? Ever see the graceful, sinuous movement of a winding river? The veiled beauty of a waterfall? Or the effervescent movement of the waves? From her movements, she unleashes her inner energy. From the singular note of a droplet to the crescendo produced from a wave, she defines the music art form, both solo and the vibrancy of an orchestra. Ever hear a water drip from a faucet? Or the rhythm of the rain?
earth prithvi is the densest element and is the mother that sustains and nurtures life she symbolizes stability fertility and endurance she is reliable peaceful and tranquil life in the form of plants and animals thrive here in abundance bringing beauty and joy it is this joy that makes the planet a haven for celebration she is the strengthening foundation of our race of the various shaktis of the elements we experience life and through the beauty of life we experience the god the ultimate god is eternally around us The Nadi field has been created by the matter-free Vayu force motion lines. The Vayu forces are in motion in this field and gliding as Pingala current to vitalize the material body on the one side and on the other as Ida current, it makes the mind operate. There is a central power line called Shushumna which exercises its control over Ida and Pingala flows and in which the centralization of the Vayu forces has occurred. The Vayu forces are constantly oozing from the Shushumna centers, causing the Ida Pingala currents. In these centers, the centrifugal Vayu forces can be controlled and harmonized, and also stopped. The basic part of the Shushumna centers are Tanmatra Mahabhuta forces, each center consists of two parts, the center itself and a peripheral aspect. The center is an infinitesimal point, which from a material point of view is zero. This point in the substratum is a power concentrated to its highest degree, which arises from the primary inertia principle, tamas, and is called tanmatra force. This force is the nature of germ mantra, seed mantra. The Tan Matra force, being transformed into Mahabhuta force, appears as circular radiant energy, emitting certain Matrika units. This is the peripheral aspect. This is a Shushumna center and is termed Chakra. There are five lower chakras in the Shushumna which are formed of Tan Matra Mahabhuta forces. The chakras are stabilized by their Tan Matra Mahabhuta forces because of their inertial nature. The inertial factor is more pronounced in Prithivi, Earth Metamatter Force, Wave Character in Ap, Brilliance in Power in Tehas, Fire, and Highly Purified Energy in Vayu, Air. The Akash, Void Force, is the basis of them all. The Tan Matra Forces are so subtle and concentrated that they can only be realized in their Mantra forms. Each Tan Matra force represents a specific germ or seed mantra. A germ mantra consists of three fundamental parts, Bij, Nada, and Bindu. He 
Even the most abstract of the Buddha's teachings had a practical, ethical dimension. Compassion, the Buddha taught, comes from understanding impermanence, transience, flow, how one thing passes into another, how everything and everyone is connected. When this is, that is. From the arising of this comes the arising of that. When this isn't, that isn't. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. This is always connected to that. Everything is connected to everything else. You never live by yourself. You live always within a family, a society, a culture. You constantly uh, interact with other people all the time. So our happiness depends on their happiness as well. How can we be happy uh, if we are the only one happy in uh, an, uh, you know, just an island of happiness within an ocean of misery? Of course, that's, that's not possible. Buddhism teaches that nothing exists independently. Instead, all phenomena and all beings are caused to exist by other phenomena and beings. The existence of all things is interdependent. Our existence as human beings depends on earth, air, water, and other forms of life. Just as our existence depends on and is conditioned by these things, they also are conditioned by our existence. The way we think of ourselves as being separate from earth and air and nature is part of our essential ignorance, according to Buddhist teaching. The many different things, rocks, flowers, babies, and asphalt and car exhausts, are expressions of us, and we are expressions of them. The division of organic and inorganic mental and non-mental are divisions from the object point of view only. The Shankya order of creation suggests that every individual is a composite one so far as the five elements and their transformations are concerned. The creations, etc., are applicable mostly to empirical variants of the universe, which are generally categorized under Prakriti. According to the Sankhya Yoga system, the effect must be in the cause because a non-entity cannot be produced. Cause and effect are one. Choice of material implies the previous existence of the effect. Again, production is not arbitrary. Production means the manifestation of an attribute implicitly present in the root substance. And cessation connotes the relapse of that manifested attribute into the unmanifest state. Causality presupposes determined capacity of the cause to produce a determined effect. This capacity can come into play only if there is a relation between it and what is produced. The very possibility of causality implies that the effect must be existent in the cause. Pakriti, thus, is the ultimate causal ground of the whole flux of phenomenal order. Pakriti is the primus of the whole material and psychical order of phenomena. Though Prakriti is numerically one singular entity, it is by no means a simple homogeneous substance. It is the union of opposites. It consists of three elements vis-a-vis -vis sattva, rajas, and tamas, which are, by their nature and functions, opposed to one another. This opposition is kept in check when Prakriti is in its pure state of equilibrium prior to evolution. Sattva is primarily responsible for self-maintenance and self-manifestation of Prakriti. Rajas is the cause of all activity. Tamas is responsible for inertia and restraint of activity. These three elements have different expressions in the material and psychical plane. At the time of creation, vibration, also termed Maya, starts in the absolute. In this super vibration, the three gunas Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas are generated. The Sattva indicates consciousness, Tamas, inertia, 
and rajas, a combination of both. The prefix pra in the word prakriti means exalted, superior, excellent, and the affix kriti denotes creation. Pra signifies the sattvagun, the most exalted quality. Kri denotes the rajogun, and ti denotes the tamogun. There, the five puttas or elements are present in subtle form. For vibration, some space is required, which is produced by ether. It has sound as its property. The vibratory movement is obviously unsteady. It is in the nature of wind or air. When the vibration is in the state of appearance, it is soft, being subtle. Viscosity is the nature of water. The lack of knowledge of consciousness of it is the veritable toughness of the earth. So, it is said that the gunas and the five puttas or elements are present in the vibration in a subtle form. Later, the five elements are separated from the tamas and attained a distinct nature. The original state of equilibrium among the gunas create agitation among the gunas when all the gunas become manifest along with their capacities, cognition, activity, and substance. According to the Vedanta, which generally follows the Samkhya school, the creation process is dormant in this nature, or prakriti. It becomes active or productive when it comes into contact with the sentient but inactive purusha. In the evolutes of prakriti, mention should be made of five elements, mahaputas, and five subtle elements, tanmatras. From the puthadi, different tanmatras are generated which have only the potential power of affecting our senses. The fivefold classification of the elements is not based on any chemical principle, but from the point of view of the five senses through which their knowledge comes to us. Each succeeding gross element has more properties than the succeeding one because of the larger number of tan matras fashioning it. The ether, akash, encompasses in itself the reality of Brahman and the unreality of Maya. As Akash is smaller than Maya by one degree, void, emptiness, and sound are marked by the characteristics of ether. From Akash, Vayu or air emanated. Air is also marked by Brahman, Maya Akash, with their real, unreal, and sound aspects. In addition, it has got the quality of touch. Air is less permeative than Akash by one degree and it is unsteady. From air, fire is born. It has got all the earlier qualities with the addition of form. Fire is less permeative than air by 10 degrees. From fire, water is created. In addition to all the qualities of the earlier causes, it has got taste as the additional one. Moreover, it has got two more qualities, softness and fluidity. Water is less permeative than fire by 10 degrees. From water, earth is born. It has got smell as one additional quality. In addition to all those, it has got three more qualities as well. Hardness, substance, and smell. Earth is less permeative than water by 10 degrees. In Karaga 38.10, it is told that the subtle elements are nonspecific. From these five proceed the five gross elements. The five gross elements are known as specific beings, tranquil, terrific, and stupefying. The Gun Domination over the Prakriti evolution is quite apparent. The Tan Matras possess physical characteristics like penetrability, pressure, heat, capacity for cohesive attraction. They also possess the potentials of the energies represented by sound, touch, color, taste, and smell. Together these are combined to create the cosmic manifestation. These potentials are within the subtle matter. They undergo transformations by new groupings before they act as stimuli to the gross matter. The five classes of items are generated from the tanmatras. Sound potential and akash touch potentials combine with the vibratory particles to generate the vayu atom, the air atom. The light and heat potentials combine with touch potentials and sound potentials to create the tehas, fire atom. The taste potentials combine with light, heat, touch, and sound potentials to generate up, water. And the smell potentials combine with the preceding potentials to generate the earth atom.
Here is a chart to further demonstrate what is called the Panchikarana grossification and materialization process. In that process, every element is equally divided into two halves. One half is kept the same, and the other half is further divided with four equal parts, and each is allocated to each of the remaining four. Here is a table showing these correspondences playing out in manifestation. These five gross elements, ether, air, fire, water, and earth, together with the three subtle elements of mind, intelligence, and ego, form the eight creative principles of manifestation. Let's take a look at how these elements emerge from the two main forces, Purusha Prakriti, and thence from the undifferentiated Tao, or Supreme Bindu, Param Shiva. Supreme Reality, the eternal static whole consciousness, is inconceivable at any stage of evolution. Supreme Power, which is inseparable from Supreme Consciousness, is in its power aspect, evolving creative principles. The seed of duality is born with the emergence of two great principles, Purusha, Consciousness, Male, Solar Principle, and Prakriti, Primus, Female, Lunar Principle and duality becomes an established fact in sense consciousness. In Purusha, consciousness is not tinged with what is not consciousness. This means that though Prakriti has emerged, it is non-existent in the Purusha consciousness, and consequently there is no Prakriti while one is in Purusha. Prakriti is unmanifest here. Unmanifested to whom? To Purusha. Or when one is in Purusha, that is in one's own conscious form. The three primary attributes of Prakriti are in a negative phase. But Prakriti is not nothing. It is the source of all created phenomena. But how are its creative possibilities actualized? Can we say when Prakriti is seen, Prabhurusha? What is it that is seen? Purusha consciousness is that in which there is nothing but consciousness. Prakriti is not consciousness, so it does not exist in Purusha consciousness. Though Prakriti is negated in Purusha consciousness, it nonetheless exists. It exists as an aspect of power, Shakti, and that power in itself is inseparable from, and one and the same with, Supreme Consciousness. It is infinite but its power manifestation is only possible when the power becomes finite. It is only possible when the power becomes finite for the power manifestation to occur. It is only possible when an unreal phenomena, quote unquote, unreal in relation to the supreme reality, is made to appear real. This is affected by Maya, the specific power of the Supreme Power. By the influence of this power, Supreme Consciousness appears as Purusha and Supreme Power in its Bindu, supremely concentrated power aspect, appears as Prakriti. Prakriti is that aspect of Bindu, power, in which creative energy is in three forms as minus factors. These forms are called gunas, primary attributes. In Prakriti, the gunas are negative factors, but there is a possibility of the gunas becoming patent when Prakriti becomes the source of creation. But the gunas remain negative in Prakriti, 
unless they are aroused by something from outside Prakriti. From where does this something come? Purusha and Prakriti may be interpreted differently when there is no experience above the Purusha Prakriti level. Purusha is consciousness in which there is no trace of anything else. As this consciousness is not analyzable or reducible, so Purusha is the ultimate principle. And Prakriti exists as an independent principle, which is not consciousness. If we accept this, we have to explain the nature of the relation between consciousness and what is not consciousness. It is said that Purusha is lame, but can see, and Prakriti can move, but does not see. It is as if Purusha sits on the shoulders of Prakriti and shows the way, and Prakriti moves blindly. This means Prakriti is in contact with conscious Purusha and undergoes evolutionary changes. But what does it actually mean? Does it not indicate that Purusha is also endowed with power that makes Prakriti evolve? If it is assumed that consciousness itself is the stimulus to make Prakriti evolve, then we have also to assume that Purusha consciousness exerts some influence on Prakriti, either consciously or unconsciously. This Purusha influence on Prakriti cannot altogether be denied. This means consciousness as power, which is not without motive, is the root cause of the evolutionary changes of Prakriti. The Purusha is the male positive solar principle, which by its power conditions the receptive female lunar Prakriti. Consciousness, therefore, can be represented by a positive plus sign and power by a negative sign. However, if Purusha and Prakriti were only positive and negative factors eternally separated from one another, then there would be no possibility of either being able to exert influence on the other. Rather, each positive and negative factor contains within it a factor of the opposite polarity. Purusha is related to the prana, na, sound radiating principle, and Prakriti is related to Kundalini, the bindu, sound concentrated principle. However, the bindu in manifestation exists as Ardhendu, the waxing and waning crescent moon, which is a positive negative principle. The Ardhendu principle is conditioned by the control power, or Nirodhika factor which is a negative-positive principle associated with the Purusha. According to the Tantric texts, Narodhika, the spiritual control energy, is the white bindu, Shiva's semen, or Ojas, which is said to fall from the moon. Ardendu is the red bindu, Haranyagarbha, the cosmic egg, or the womb of Shakti, which comes out of the sun. The union of these two causes worldly creation as well as human enlightenment. These factors represent the manifest Tao, which, although one, differentiates into two upon birth in the material world, and unites again into one upon birth into the spiritual world. The one effective, true essence logos united with life, when it descends into the house of the creative, divides into animus and anima. The animus is in the heavenly heart. It is of the nature of light. It is the power of lightness and purity. It is that which we have received from the great emptiness, that which has formed from the very beginning. The anima partakes of the nature of darkness. It is the power of the heavy and the turbid. It is bound to the bodily, fleshly heart. The animus loves life. The animus seeks death. All sensuous pleasures and impulses to anger are effects of the anima. It is the conscious spirit which after death is nourished on blood, but which, during life, is in direst need. Darkness returns to darkness and like things attract each other. But the pupil understands how to distill the dark anima so that it transforms itself into light. Purusha and Prakriti are the manifest fractally connected consciousness power of the supreme non-dual bindu, the whole infinite supreme Shiva Shakti united together as supreme consciousness power. Through their existence, each unit of consciousness is potentially infinite as well. Through them, all things 
are of the basic nature of infinite consciousness power. They are our very life, and we are inseparable from them. Supreme Bindu is both consciousness and power. In its creative aspect, the power is prana energy in a supremely concentrated state. On the other hand, Kundalini power is associated with Supreme Bindu in its spiritual aspect. When creative prana energy is manifested, the spiritual Kundalini power remains in a coiled state. To make a finite phenomenon possible in infinite Supreme Consciousness power, Maya, Negado Positivity Principle, arises from Supreme Bindu. By the influence of Maya, Prakriti appears as a separate principle in which is embedded the creative germ consisting of three primary principles as minus factors, and from the mantra viewpoint, Prakriti is Kamakala, in which lie the pre matrika units in latent form. With the evolution of Prakriti also arises Purusha as consciousness separate from but related to Prakriti. Purusha consciousness is Shiva consciousness, as if isolated from Supreme Consciousness power by Maya. The emergence of Purusha is a most important phenomenon. The passivity of Purusha does not stir the Prakriti directly, but as Purusha Consciousness is the consciousness of Supreme Bindu, which as Ishwar, Supreme Being in his creative aspect, wills to express his or her creative omnipotence. It is this will which acts on Prakriti silently to make the Guns operate. The Guns operate on the principle of Bindu, Nada, Beach. The nod or sound radiating principle becomes Rajas, primary energy principle, which is the source of all energy in the mental and physical, physical fields. The same power becomes transformed into Sattva, primary sentience principle, which exhibits mental consciousness. The same nod power becomes Tamas, primary inertia principle, which creates metamatter and matter. Kamakala and Prakriti are not fundamentally different. The nature of the powers inherent in Prakriti is in the sound forms that are represented in Kamakala. The three gunas in Prakriti are the three lines of an equilateral triangle consisting in latent sound units which form Kamakala. When the guns begin to operate, the Kamakala triangle, as it were, bursts and emits sound which is known as pranava or om sound. The power which is involved in transforming the minus gunas into plus ones, thus affecting their operations, is in the nature of pranava sound. The pure energy is from prana and the control of that energy is from Kundali power expressed as Pranava sound. Prakriti does not exist above the Purusha level. The existence of Prakriti is due to Maya, and with the absorption of Maya, Prakriti is also absorbed, and what remains is Bindu power consciousness in Supreme Bindu. The absorption of Maya is a great step towards the rousing of Kundali power to the extent when it absorbs all sound forms as well as prana. Now Kundalini as Supreme Kundalini is the spiritual aspect of Supreme Power. But Supreme Power in its creative aspect is Supreme Bindu, in which prana energy is supremely concentrated and on which Kundali as Shabda Brahman exerts control through sound power to raise the level of creative omnipotence. Power in Supreme Bindu exists in two forms, Prana and Kundalini. Prana is the energy principle of Supreme Power in its omnipotent aspect, which is expressed as creative omnipotency. Supreme Power in its spiritual aspect is Kundalini. In Supreme Bindu, energy is in a supremely concentrated form ready to manifest its creative omnipotence. 
Therefore, the prana energy flow is away from Supreme Consciousness. Prana is the living energy. At the Prakriti level, a part of prana energy is released which trifurcates as non-living gunas. Kundali power is conscious spiritual power which flows most powerfully only towards Supreme Consciousness when prana flow is controlled. But prana, at the Bindu point, is also controlled by kundali power. This kundali control makes prana energy exhibit highest yoga vibhuti, that is, creative omnipotence. Supreme power in her power aspect is Supreme Bindu, and Supreme Bindu in its creative aspect is Ishvara. Kundalini has two aspects, supreme and sound. In her aspect as Kundalini, Supreme Kundalini, Maha Kundalini, is united with Supreme Consciousness and is one with that. At this level there is complete absence of sound of any form, Ashabda. Kundalini in this aspect is infinite Supreme Consciousness, having no attributes. But in her specific powerfulness, Supreme Power is able to produce a power phenomenon from which emerges the universe of mind and matter. At this stage, Kundalini is Shabda Brahman, and her power is in the nature of sound substance, Tani. Sound substance is not manifest as sound, it is the life energy principle, Prana, which creates and operates in what has been created. This living sound power is the causal sound, and is called Para Sound. Supreme Brahman appears as Shabda Brahman when Supreme Power, which is one and the same with Brahman as Maha Kundalini, wills to express the kinetic counterpart of the static quiescent eternal reality. This aspect of Brahman is called Shabda Brahman because the power which is going to be expressed is in the nature of Nad, a phenomenon in which willing is imbued with effectivity in the form of free sound which becomes Supreme Bindu, the supremely concentrated power. The concentration is such as is fully ready to actualize the willing of Supreme Power in her purely power aspect. This concentrated power is Bindu. Because it is non-magnitudinous and non-positional power, which when magnified appears as splendorous and permeated with sonority without manifested sound, this power is Kundalini as Shabda Brahman. Here lies the principle of sound, sound unmanifest and undifferentiated, but power in maximum concentration and in the nature of sound substance. This power sound is para sound. Sound exists in four forms, the Brahmanas, the seers of Shabda Brahman, who have controlled their minds fully, know these four forms. Of these, the first three are hidden and unknown. The fourth form of sound is used by human beings, Rig Veda. The four forms of sound are Parda, Supreme, Pasyanti, Radiant, Madhyama, subliminal, and Vaikani, acoustic. The human beings hear only a part of acoustic sounds. The yogis hear the other three forms in Samadhi. About the four forms of sound, it has been stated, sound is about to sprout in Bhara, supreme form. It becomes Thuli, that is, first manifested in Pashanti, radiant form, 
It buds in Madhyama, subliminal form, and it blooms in Vaikari, acoustic form. Sound which has been developed in the above-mentioned manner will become unmanifested when the order is reversed. Maheshwar said, What is called Shabda Brahman, the nature of which is nada, causal, or unmanifested sound, is an aspect of supreme infinite being. Shabda Brahman as Shakti, power, is in the form of Bindu, supremely concentrated conscious power, and being in Muladhara, that Shakti becomes Kundalini. From that arises Nada, sound, like a sprout from a minute seed called Pashanti, by means of which the yogis see the universe. In the region of the heart, it becomes more pronounced, resembling thunder in the atmosphere. It is called Madhyama. Again it, Madhyama, becomes Swara, voice, by the expiratory help. And that is called Vaikhari, Yoga Shiksha It has been disclosed that Shabda Brahman is the source of sound. Shabda Brahman is in the form of sound, which is unmanifest, so it is called para. The power in Shabda Brahman is Bindu, from which issued the universe that is in the nature of Pranava, Aum, the first manifest sound. The cosmic Bindu in an individual being resides in the Muladhar as Kula Kundalini, who is the source of all sounds. From the Kundalini arises Pashanti Nada. Pashanti becomes more pronounced and particularized in the heart and is called Madhyama. The Madhyama sound is expressed as voice, and this is Vaikari. The vai this Vaikari exposition of sound has been adopted in the Tantras with explanation in greater detail. Shiva says, The source of Nad, sound, which is called Para, causal, arises in the Muladhar. That sound, being in Svaristana, becomes manifested and is called Pashanti. The sound going up to Anahata becomes reflected in the conscious principle and is called Madhyama. Then going upwards in Vishuddha, in the region of the neck, by the instrument of the larynx, palate, the root and tip of the tongue, teeth, lips and navel cavities, it becomes Vaikhari. Tantra Raja Tantra. Further, that eternal Kundalini in her Shabda Brahman aspect is the source of power in which is Tuani, power as supremely rarefied sound that develops as Nara, then Nirodhika, fire energy expressed in control, Ardhendu, the crescent moon, Bindu, point, and Para, supreme. Nara, then Nirodhika, fire energy expressed in control, Ardhendu, the crescent moon, Bindu, point. And from Bhara arise Pashanti, Madhyama, and Vaikhari sounds. Sharada Tilaka Tantra. Kundalini as Shabda Brahman is endowed with power which is in the nature of sound substance, having the possibility of developing a sound power, Nad, which is absorbed with fire energy in the form of control power, that is, higher spiritual energy. 
The sound power assumes a semilunar shape with which is connected concentrated divine power consciousness. This is the latent sound which is unmanifest. This is para sound. From para sound arises Pashanti, then Madhyama, then finally Vaihari. Let me briefly explain the Fushi arrangement for you. I'd like to start from Kun. Kun here you see three broken knights. So the Yin had risen to its uttermost. And Yang, one side knight represent Yang, is about to emerge. Then from here, the Yang energy start to show up. This triagram is called Zhen. Zhen, you see one Yang just emerged. And then next one is called Di. Di, which one in, one broken line in between two yang, which indicates that in and yang are of equal length. Yet yang is increasing. Next one is called Dui, which one in on the top of two yang. This shows that Yang advanced further, while Yin is further retreated. After that, you see three sided knight. This one is called Chen Triagrams. Yang showed the energy had attained its utmost strength. Then Yin started creeping in. So after that, it's called Xin. We had one in, under, and two yang on top. After Xun, it's called Kan, which one yang, one side knight in between two broken knight, two in. This shows that in advance while yang retreats. After Kan, it's called Gun. You see only one yang on the top and two in, two broken knight below. So Yang decreases further as Yin continues to grow. Then it returns to the Kun Chagrim once again. So here we see Yin had attained its uttermost. Here is the cell dividing, generating perfect tetrahedron. See? If the, if the first cell is, is divided in two, the, the first cell divides in two, makes two cells, right? And then as you go, these two cells divides in two again, that makes four cells. The four cells don't make a cube, they make a perfect tetrahedron, you see? And each of these cells will divide again, making another set of four, and these four will go in between and make the reverse tetrahedron. And they'll continue to grow from four to eight to 16 to 32 to 64. And it will not start to differentiate the cells until it gets to 64. It will say, you know, T cells or, or fundamental cells until it gets to 64. And then at 64, then it starts to make brain cells, heart cells, liver cells, and all sorts of other cells. So you all went through this very specific geometry to get here. The ancient Chinese system of wisdom called the I Ching is based on 64 hexagrams, symbols with six lines in a set, some continuous, some broken. These can be put together as the six edges of a tetrahedron, and together would form the 64 tetrahedron crystal. As we can see, 
all creation originates through this binary system of 64 hexagrams, which represent progressively expansive fractal scales of sound power emanating from a non-dual center. At the first scale, this supreme positive and negative factors emerge from a unified center, and at the next scale they divide into four, whereupon we can see some sort of rotation or polar shift occurring between the scales, which seem to be instrumental to this polarity switch design, which operates on a fractal scale to connect all levels of the system with one another. Next, withholding a portion of the essence of the previous scale, they divide in half and then combine the halves together in unique ways and arrange themselves into groups of trigrams, which then follow the same pattern and combine to eventually manifest as 64 unique hexagrams. This is the unfoldment of the 64 tetrahedron grid, aka the Flower of Life Crystal or Merkaba. These principles of the actualization of power through sound arise from Shabda Brahman as concentration of the infinite power consciousness into the form of Sun, Supreme Sound, Nod, Moon, Supreme Sound, Concentration, Bindu, and Fire, Concentrated, Specialized, Manifested Sound, Bij. These three factors exist as separate aspects of the Supreme Bindu which manifests itself as these three bindus before manifesting at the Pashanti level as the supreme radiant sound. Aum. Each of the three power points, having been extended from the supreme central bindu, emits a number of sound potentials, would-be units, arranged in a line, and these lines form a triangle. This triangle is the center of the great Sri Yantra, which is said to be the geometric representation of the cosmic Aum vibration. Through Nassim Harmin's work on his dual Taurus model, he shows how that through a constant swing of polarity between manifest and unmanifest, passive and active, light and dark, yin and yang, Shiva and Shakti, which is of course based upon the simultaneous unity and apparent separation of Tao, all phenomena in the universe are either made to be created, preserved, or destroyed. It is interesting to note that in theosophical texts, triangles are always symbols of a balance between a polarity of positive, negative, and positive, negative. Like the waxing and waning of the moon, the triangular tetrahedral shape of our vibrational egg matrix 
allows for a movement between positive and negative poles fixed at some central point and interplay between points at a local or fractal scale. The most crucial thing to understand about this system of being is that in each moment the power of creation, ah, preservation, oh, and destruction, mm, are acting upon the field of reality, creating, preserving, and destroying, turning on grand cycles of time, kala, within smaller cycles, wheels within wheels. Reality is constantly emerging from and dissolving into the whirling of the cosmic lotus flower of Sri Radha Govindaji. Nasim Haramein calls the stuff exchanged in his system information, but we shall call it instead vibration, spawned on a sound power, or na, from which arises the term nadi, which creates the matrix of our subtle vibrational power grid through motion of pranic or sound power. Each atom has a lifespan, just like we as atoms, in our universe as atoms, have lifespans, and it is created, preserved, and destroyed as it rotates on its polar axis, based on this cycle. Our body is formed of the interplay of these great atomic universes as they dance their own dance in tune with the whole cosmos. This divine goddess of creation is called Sri Chakra, Sri Yantra, Nadi Chakra, the toroidal field, the germinal vesicle, the flower of life, the golden flower, etc., etc. She is the matrix which creates, sustains, and destroys the various bodies, as well as evolves or devolves them as they move along the axes of time. Shivashakti.com has this to say about the Sri Yantra. All creation, manifestation, and dissolution is considered to be a play of Lalita Tripura Sundari, the Red Goddess. Maha Tripura Sundari is her name as transcendental beauty of the three cities, a description of the goddess as conqueror of the three cities of the demons, or as the triple city, Tripura, but really as a metaphor for a human being. What then is a yantra? The word is usually translated as machine, but in the special sense of the tantric tradition it refers to the devi, goddess, in her linear or geometric form. Every aspect of God has its own mantra and yantra, and this Sri Yantra is the Yantra of Devi Lalita. She dwells at the center space position which is always occupied by the deity of the Yantra. The different parts or petals and lines of the yantra are usually arranged in concentric circles, mandalas, and contains rays or sublimbs of Devi, the goddess. The Sri Yantra has nine of these mandalas, each filled with various aspects of the Devi. In Sri Yantra, there are 111 aspects. The Sri Yantra is said to be a geometric form of the human body which implies that goddess as macrocosm is one with human being as microcosm. Goddess as macrocosm is one with human being as microcosm. Goddess as macrocosm is one with human being as microcosm. Goddess as macrocosm is one with human being as microcosm. Goddess as macrocosm is one. The creation of Sri Yantra is described in the Yogini Hridaya Tantra, that is the heart of the Yogini Tantra. The ultimate Shakti, that is power, Prakriti, energy, by her own will, Svechoya, assumed the form of the universe, first as a pulsating essence consisting of the vowels of the alphabet 
and from the void-like bowels with the visharga, which means a drop or fall, emerged the bindu, quivering and fully conscious. From this pulsating stream of supreme light emanated the ocean of the cosmos, the very self of the three mothers. The bindu of the yantra corresponds to dharma, adharma, and atma, that is, righteousness or truth, unrighteousness or untruth, and atma, self. The bindu is situated on a dense, flowering mass of lotus, and is self-aware consciousness, the chitkala, the quivering union of Shiva and Shakti gradually creates the different mandalas of the Sri Yantra, which correspond to the different matrika letters of the Sanskrit alphabet. The Kamakala triangle subsists in the Mahabindu, the great Bindu, and is without parts. The text refers to nine different and successively subtle forms of sound which are beyond the vowels and consonants of the 50 matrika letters of the alphabet. She is every kind of shakti, including icha, will, jnan, knowledge, and kriya, action, and exists as four pitas, or sacred centers, represented by the letters ka, as in kamarup, pu, as in purnagiri, Ja as in Jalandhara, and Od as in Odhya. These seats exist in the microcosm between the anus and genitals, at the heart, in the head, and in the bindu above the head, and have the forms of square, hexagon in a circle with a bindu, a crescent moon, and a triangle, and are of the colors yellow, purple, white, and red. These also correspond to the three lingams, which are known as Svayambhu, Bana, and Itara and Para, which are situated in the pitas and are colored gold, bhandaka red, and like the autumn season moon. The vowels, which are divided into three, are situated in the Svayambhu lingam, the letters ka and ta are situated with the bana lingam. The letters ta and sa are in the kadamba region. While the entire circle of the letters, the matrika, are associated with the para or supreme lingam, which is one with the essence of the bindu, of the yantra, and is the root of the tree of supreme bliss. From the fivefold shakti comes creation, and from the fourfold fire comes dissolution or destruction. The sexual union of five shaktis and the four fires causes the chakra to evolve. O oh, sinless one, I speak to you of the origin of the chakra.
Shakti is fivefold and refers to creation, while Shiva is fourfold and related to dissolution. The union of the five Shaktis and the four fires creates the chakra. That is the Shri Yantra. Shiva and Shakti are fire and moon bindus, and the contact of both causes the Hardakala to flow, which becomes the sun, the third bindu, and which gives rise to the Bindava, or the first chakra. It is this first chakra, the bindu at the center of the yantra, which gives rise to the nine triangles, or Nava Yoni. And these, in turn, cause the nine mandalas of the yantra to blossom. This Bindava, or central bindu, is Shiva and Shakti, also referred to in the text as the light and its mirror. The Bindava of the chakra has a triple form, Dharma, Adharma, and Atma. The chakra of nine yonis is the great mass of consciousness bliss and is the ninefold chakra and the nine divisions of the mantra. The Bindava is placed on a dense flowery mass and is the Chitkala. Similarly, the Ambika form of eight lines is the circle of vowels. The nine triangles quiver forth the effulgent form of ten lines. The Shakti, together with her surrounding nine, blossomed forth the ten triconas. The second quivering form of ten lines had Krodisha as first of the ten. These four chakras of the nature of light create the fourteenfold form, the essence of perception. Yogini Hridaya 6 to 16. The Sri Yantra, Lalita, the Devi or goddess raise out her attendants and shaktis as modifications of moon, sun, and fire. In this, Shiva has no place, no qualities, is without the ability to act. Only when united with Devi may he act. This is based on the subtle and practical idea of Shiva as pure consciousness, witness of the triple manifestation of his shakti. Sirikiraya, 
என் சக்கராயுத தேவி உன்னை என்ன செய்கிறேன் பார் ஆதியில் தேவியை நான் உனக்கு கொடுக்கும் காலத்தில் சொன்ன வார்த்தைகளை மறந்து அவளை அலட்சியப்படுத்தியதோடு அழிக்கவும் முயன்றதால் உன் சக்தி முற்றிலும் இழக்கக் கடவாய் This Shakti, the very essence of the three guns of Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, is the cause of all manifestation in the universe and as a human being. The three Shaktis, by blending and reblending, create, sustain, and dissolve all things. Shakti is triple as sun, moon, and fire. That is to say, of all the sidereal constellations and planets, and therefore of time itself. She is triple as will, itcha, knowledge, gyan, and action, kriya. She is the threefold intellect, emotions, and physical sensation. Shakti is triple as wake, dream, and deep sleep. What is called the fourth is the witness, Shiva who is said to pervade the whole cosmos just as heat pervades a red-hot iron. The physical body, according to the precepts of Ayurveda, is triple as the humors Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. The varying combination of these three Shaktis make up the physical body. Shakti is also fivefold, as ether, air, fire, water, and earth. The combination of the five elements and the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas, produces Lalita's eternities, nityas, 15 in number, each identified with a lunar day of the bright fortnight. The moon, symbolizing Shakti, is the mirror or reflection holding together all of creation. Close examination of the details relating to the nine mandalas of Sri Yantra reveals that the Shaktis of the whole circle represent the human being who, in potential, is Shiva Shakti united. The aim for a person is to realize that all powers, energies, and manifestations are Shaktis of consciousness, pure awareness. The yantra may be examined in two ways, either as manifestation or dissolution. Maintenance is an intermediate state between the two polarities. When she is worshipped as creatrix, the order is from the center to the perimeter. As dissolver, the order is reversed from perimeter to center. The center point of the Sri Yantra is the Supreme Bindu. Creation occurs when, at a certain point of concentration of this triangulated energy, Supreme Bindu bursts, as it were, and a great concentrated power in the form of sound emanates. The syllable ah, a is said to be the bird om's right wing. 
Uu Upanishad is said to be its left. M mm M -hmm, its tail. In the Arda Matra, that is the half meter after the M, is said to be the bird Om's head. The rajasic and tamasic qualities are the bird's feet upwards to the loins, and the sattva gun is its main body. Dharma is considered to be its right eye, and adharma is considered to be its left. That is, dharma, religiosity, truth, righteousness is considered to be its right eye, and adharma, untruth, injustice is considered to be its left eye. This power sound is the pranava nod and is heard, quote unquote, by the yogis in concentration. The power aspect is concentrated prana energy from which the name pranava is derived. The prana energy in motion creates a series of force motion lines consisting of four phases. On its first emergence from the Supreme Bindu, it creates the A ah line, the A phase, which is transformed into the U line called the U phase. It is then changed into the M line, the M phase. Finally, it assumes O, tantrika letter O shaped line, in which M is changed into Nad Bindu, and O becomes the beach to form O, as it is seen by the yogis in concentration. In this power form, the sound factor is inseparable. The power is the sound, and the sound is the power. This is the first manifested power sound phenomenon, pranava. This is called pashanti sound, the first manifested radiant sound. Pranava is the first manifestation of Para, supreme sound. Para sound is the source of Pranava. So, Pranava is the first manifested sound. The Veda, language, and all other sounds. All sounds are finally absorbed in Pranava and Pranava into Para sound. Para sound is Shabda Brahman. Pranava, or Aum, is a complex organization of powers in which a basic power supports various powers. Once more, Pranava Aum is a complex organization of powers in which a basic power supports various powers. The Prana force, which is in motion in Pranava, Va meaning motion, makes the three Bindus, power points, which are latent, that is unmanifested, in the form of Kamakala, the Kamakala triangle, operate, and the sound potentials begin to become actualized as Matrika Varnas, that is sound units, or Matrika letters, the 50 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet. In Supreme Bindu, which is consciousness slash power reality, there are coincide dynamism principles, potentials rather, in a massive concentrated state that now begin to develop. The consciousness factor arises from Kundalini and the power from Prana. Of these three Bindus, power points, Nod, the sound radiating factor, is the center of Pranic force, which is the fundamental sound factor and from which occurs an emission of a super refined ray, Rashmi, of red color. This is termed Rajas Gun, the primary energy principle. The red power of the Nod at the Bindu becomes yellow radiant coincide dynamism, termed Sattva Gun, the primary sentience awareness principle, perception principle. 
the sound factor of the red ray becomes a specific sound at the beige. The red power is changed here into black power, which is termed tamasgun, tamogun, primary inertia principle. So you have the red power of the nod as the primary energy principle, rajogun, the yellow power of the bindu becomes the sattvogun, sentience principle, and the black power of the bij becomes the inertia principle. The red ray emission creates a red line, the rajas line, which releases 16 sound units. In a similar manner, yellow and black lines are created and are called sattva and tamas lines respectively. From each of them, 16 sound units are released. These three lines form an equilateral triangle standing on its apex. The left side of the triangle is the red line, the base is the yellow line, and the right side is the black line. Three lines are the three forms of power, termed Vama, Jeshta, and Rudri. Vama is the red line and consists of 16 sound units from A, A to A, A, H. Jeshta is the yellow line consisting of 16 sound units from Ka to Ta, and Rudri is the black line consisting of 16 sound units from Ta to Sha. In the three angles of the triangle, there are three sound units named Ha between the red line and the yellow line, Ksha between the yellow line and the black line, and La, Ra, at the apex within the triangle between the black line and the red line. Ha is the moon point. Ksha is the sun point and La is the fire point. Bama power is associated with Brahma consciousness, Jeshta with Vishnu, and Rudri with Rudra, Shiva. The red energy in the yellow field creates mind and senses. And in the black field, it creates tanmatras and mahabhutas, the great elements. Sound units operate in madhyama sound, begins to throb in pranava and its characteristic manner, causing to be emitted what is called Force. pranava sound. The sound motion is in the nature of what has been termed shamanya spanda. Basic infinitesimal vibration, almost uniform in character. Basic infinitesimal vibration, almost uniform in character. Which shows insignificant change in form. It is more quiescent than motional. It is the motional totality without having any specificiality. The prana throbbing and sound motion are the same thing or two aspects of the same thing. Sound is the exact nature of throbbing prana. Sound is the exact nature of throbbing prana. The manifestation of prana force is in the nature of sound. Sound is in the mode of apprehension of power, which is in motion. The sound pattern of the motion is the Aum, the fourth Arda matter after A-U-M, Aum, the Pashyanti sound, the real essence of it. Aum is the whole sound. Sound is also the mode, the only mode of the uncoiling of the coiled power. That is Kundalini. At the Madhyama level, 
the pranava power sound, motion, changes from its vast and vague characteristic to a clearly defined and specific pattern in which limitedness and changeableness are more and more marked. The one pranava sound now becomes many particularized sounds. Hence, they have been termed vishesha spandana, particularized motion. The singularity of sounds arises from the bij, which is o. As there is only one sound, which is om. Now the plurality of the bija develops. But the nada bindu factor, and this is important, the nada bindu factor of pranava is retained, which becomes an intrinsic part of the newly developed bijas. Bijas. This manifold specialized sound phenomenon is madhyama sound, developed from pranava. Pashanti sound becomes madhyama sound. Pranava is the original sound, which is one and without parts, and represents the manifested power as a whole. In detailed manifestation of a power, which occurs at the madhyama level, there is an expression of specialization and plurality. The original sound, homogeneity, existing in pranava, begins to change into sound heterogeneity existing in madhyama. That is, it goes from being uniform to being specialized and particularized. Here, matraka varnas, or matraka arnas, that means primary sound units, come into being. The word matraka means mother, but here it is used in a technical sense. It stands for the varnas, the particularized sound forms, as a whole. Varna is usually translated as a letter of the alphabet, but the technical meaning of it is a particular sound form. There are 50 varnas, or sound forms. Collectively, all 50 sound forms are called matrika, so it is called the garland of 50, mala panchashika. The 50 sound forms are from A to Ksha. The sound forms from A to Ksha are collectively called Matrika. As there are 50 Matrika letters from A to Ksha, Matrika is called 50 Matrikas also. Panchashana Matrika. These sound forms from A to Ksha are the Bijas, that is, specialized sounds. So it is stated, A to Ksha sounds, which are Matrika, are in the nature of bija. Kamadenu Tantra, chapter 1, page 1. These sound forms are not lifeless letters. They are in the nature of consciousness and power. It is stated the Varna's letters from Atiksha are Shiva and Shakti, consciousness and power. These Varna's are Shabda Brahman and exist always. Kankala Manini Tantra, chapter 1, page 1. Matraka sounds are primary sound units, and each unit exhibits a specific form of sound. A sound unit is composed of three fundamental parts, bij, nada, and bindu. The bij part represents a specific sound of one kind, without being mixed with other sounds. Through the instrumentation of the nod, the beach sound is rarefied, concentrated, and conducted into bindu, where the sound is transformed into spiritual consciousness. That's so important to understanding this whole presentation. Let me read that again. Through the instrumentation of the nod, the beach sound is rarefied, concentrated, and conducted into bindu, where the sound is transformed into spiritual consciousness. 
meditate on that one for a second. The beach of Matrika are 50, and therefore there are 50 forms of specialized sound. So we have 50 primary sound units. Matrika is a living power and forms mantra. It has been stated, Matrika is a living power and is in the form of mantra. Matrika is that power which leads to yoga. So it is stated, these are Matrika Varnas which are within the Shushumna and are in the nature of yoga. Without the help of Akshara, letters, spiritual yoga is not attained. Karma Denu Tantra, chapter 12, page 14. These Matrika sound forms are the detailed manifestation of Pranava Om. It has been stated, 50, 50 matrikas arise from the nod, hear the pranava sound, in a regular order. Matrika power is kundalini. It is stated, the sound ka is kundalini herself. Kundalini is in the form of the 50 sounds of the matrika. Gayatri Tantra 3.148 Further, kundali is in the form of 50 sounds. She is the nod and bindu. She is in the nature of consciousness. She is Prakriti, Primus, Gayatri Tantra, 3-132. And Kundali, who is in the form of 50 sounds, is eternal and the embodiment of the highest spiritual knowledge. The attainment of Supreme Brahman is only possible through her. She is Supreme Kundali. It has been stated, the thread of what has been called the garland of 50 is in the nature of power and consciousness. Kundali power, that is, the power in sound forms, has, in this manner, been strung. Shakta uh, Nanda Tarantragini, 8-8. This Matrika garland is also called the garland of spiritual knowledge. So it is stated, 50 Matrika power has been termed Gyan Amala. A garland of spiritual knowledge, Gayatri Tantra 3 149. Kundali has two aspects. One is subtle, which is beyond sound, and the other is the sound form. There are 50 sounds, and they are collectively called matrika. Sound is power. This power is in the nature of life energy principle, that is prana, and manifests as sound. The sound power is an aspect of Kundalini. Kundalini, in her sound aspect, is the principal Devata, embodied divine consciousness. Devata, the Deva, arising from the appropriate mantra. The Matrika Varnas are primary sound units. Matrika sounds arise from Kundalini and are embedded in her. So, Kundalini is the root of Matrika, and in whom again Matrika dissolves. After the dissolution of Matrika into Kundalini, she remains in her subtle form. Let's take a look at what Deepak Chopra says about the relationship between language and consciousness. The role of language is that it shapes our beliefs, our attitudes and our behavioral responses. Even though consciousness or awareness is the maker of reality, the making of reality is through language. What is language? Language is the means through which consciousness, which is all possibilities, creates patterns of intelligence that are conceived and then constructed into matter. Language constitutes the building blocks of material physical reality. We think of language as a purely human trait and that is because we experience it verbally. We experience it as linguistically structured, verbally elite. But at pre-verbal levels, language is information and energy. And all of nature is alive with language. Consciousness is the potentiality for information and energy and therefore for language. Language itself is the impulse of energy and information. In human awareness, it is experienced as words and images. 
in other forms of life, it may not be so sophisticated in its expression, it may remain pre-verbal as sound and information, as vibration and energy. Our thoughts, which are likewise quantum space-time events, impulses of information and energy, are also sound and information, vibration and memory. The book of Genesis says, And God said, Let there be light. The word spoken by God was the word light. This word light, as well as the English word loud and the Greek word logos, have their primal origin in the root leg, which means sound and word. Countless words originate from this primordial sound, looks, which in Latin means light. for law, language, legion in Greek, to gather, to call, to talk, to read, to count. Even the word religion comes from the same root sound. The same word is likhot in Gothic, likhutha amongst the Indians in Peru, lak in Melanesia, lang in Micronesia, langit amongst the Khmer of Cambodia, Lucidus in Latin, which created the word lucid in English, which means clarity. Rasit in Sanskrit, Ra in ancient Egypt, Laatu in Assyria, Larangai in the Aboriginal language of Australia, Lagat in Cornish Celtic. All these words relate to the eye of truth, to light, to knowledge, lightning, heaven, sky, fire, knowledge, all primordial words having the same origin. The Bhagavad Gita is the collection of primordial sounds that is supposed to give us knowledge and clarity by the information and energy contained in the sounds themselves. Because the sounds contain meaning, the images and insights contained in the words themselves bring about a change in our physiology. Although the original language was Sanskrit, if we understand the principles of paleolinguistic anthropology, which is the principles of the science which goes to the origin of words and sounds, then we understand that the roots of all language are the same. Language acquires different nuances of expression depending on culture and geographical locale. The words of the Bhagavad Gita in any language will evoke the same images, the same insights, the same knowledge, and the same physiological effects. Language thus gives dimensionality to the dimensionless. The dimensionless is the unified field, the field of all possibilities, pure consciousness itself, the field of pure potentiality. Out of this field of pure potentiality, Language creates material reality. The dimensionless gets born as dimensionality. Eternity gets created into space and time. Time is born of eternity. Let us look at some more examples of the common word sound image origin of all languages. As already stated, logos, light, loud, all have the same relationship. Light, logos, loud, beginning, the big bang of creation. Likewise, the ancient Norse goddesses of fate had names derived from the same root, Urth or Vertandi, 
the Gothic Werth, the Anglo-Saxon Werd, the Old Nordic Vard, all go back to the Sanskrit root Vrit, which means disturbance in consciousness. All these words mean to unroll, to become, to come into being. The Aramic word Varda, the Arabic Vard, the Hebrew Werd means bud, that which comes into being, and the rose, that which has become. And so we see a resonance of what we find in the book of Genesis, in the Gospel of St. John, when he says, And first there was the Word, and the Word was made into flesh. In Sanskrit, first there was vritti in Chetna, which is consciousness, and vritti was the Word, it was the quantum fluctuation. And therefore, it becomes obvious that matter, information, and energy are born of language which is the disturbance in the quantum field. What is becoming very clear now is that time too is similarly engendered in the self. Time is quantified eternity, born through conceptualization, the movement of thought, in other words, language. It is now known that in primeval man, time was first conceived and experienced in the biological periodicities of the human menstrual cycle. That was the actual primal meter or measuring device. The Greek word metra originally meant uterus. It was the only measure. Matter, metra, mater, which is mother, are all related to the same sounds. All words signifying measurement come from this word root. In Sanskrit, matra means to measure. Matri has anything to do with mother, which is the first measurement of existence. And then a whole conglomeration of words derived from the same origin. Measurement, dimension, diameter, immense, parameter, thermometer, meter. Matra, uterus. To be born from nothingness, to give rise to form, to cause to be born, to come from the dimensionless in the world of dimensions. In other words, to become material, all having the same origin. And so too, we can find examples when we look at other words. The words God, Ra, Allah, Brahma, Atma. Yahweh, Ram, Baal, Ahura, Ag, Mab, Nagwal, all have the same origin. Similarly, the words Deva, Deity, Divine, Devil, Diabolical, Tenafil, the same origin. The words Zen, Chan, Dhyan, Meditation, have the same primordial origin. Sounds create communication. The words Akash, Kash, to shine, to appear, Shunyata, the void, all have the same origin. So it is going to be the thesis of these tapes that you're listening to, that language is the maker of reality. For the sake of convenience, I have divided language into verbal and pre-verbal language. And my thesis is that pre-verbal language exists in all of nature. It is sound and information memory and vibration that this whole universe is alive with language and then as a late stage of the evolutionary development of the human nervous system we have verbal language which is just a more sophisticated form of the same sounds of information and energy that are pervasive in all of nature but this verbal language has given rise to a whole new world, the world of technology, the world of human civilization, the world of culture, the world of religion, the world of spirituality. In fact, nothing that we take for granted in the world of civilization, jet planes, computers, fax machines, telephones, radio, television, 
would be possible had it not been for the development of linguistically structured thought. However, let us not lose sight of the fact that linguistically structured thought is not the only way of thinking. Nature thinks, and nature thinks through sound and vibration. Sounds create communication. Whales, for instance, can literally talk to one another over distances of hundreds of miles. Computer analysis of these exchanges has shown an information density of between 1 and 10 million bits per half an hour of whale song, which is the approximate amount of all the information contained in the Odyssey. Pythagoras said, a stone is frozen music, frozen sound. And there's a Zen saying, matter comes from the void, and the void creates through sound and vibration. The void is matter, and matter is the void. Words, therefore, are symbols that express thoughts, emotions, intentions. They are not just fleeting events enclosed in mental space. They are the expressions of awareness, the fundamental stuff of life. They are impulses of energy and information, space-time events that convert pure abstract potential into a solid thing. And as I said before, the Gospel of St. John states, First there was the Word, and the Word was made into flesh. And also in the New Testament, the Roman centurion, when he encounters Christ, says, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but speak the Word, and my soul shall be healed. In modern language, we can say that quantum events in consciousness transform themselves into neuropeptides in the brain as well as the body. The new paradigm tells us that awareness produces biochemistry. The flow of awareness translates into the flow of biological information. And the flow of biological information can be through words and words can become the triggers for transformation in this field of biological information. Words can create our everyday reality, our life experiences, our health. Words can also determine our ability to fulfill our desires because the ability to fulfill our desires is just a function of our beliefs, our assumptions, our expectations and our self-image. These beliefs and assumptions and expectations and self-image in turn are a product of our own internal dialogue. The words we use, the words we hear, the words that silently permeate our consciousness in every moment of our lives are constantly creating the program, the drama of our existence. There is therefore incalculable power in words. Words send messages to the core of cellular life. Do not, therefore, be misled by the power of words. They may be ephemeral and abstract, wisps of memory and desire, but they can be the harbingers of death, destruction and war. They can also bring peace, harmony, laughter and knowledge. And they can also heal. The verbal messages we hear in our heads are just one version of the information being exchanged from cell to cell every second. Every word imprinted in your consciousness can give the unconscious new assumptions and beliefs to operate with. Every word can activate a messenger molecule in your brain because wherever a thought goes, a molecule goes with it. The verses of the Bhagavad Gita will trigger mental impulses in your consciousness that will get transformed automatically into new biological information that will bring about healing in your physiology. Other words will bring about transformations in your awareness that will open you up to the full unfoldment of your potential into the field of all possibilities, making it possible for you to fulfill any desire you have. Your redefined sense of self will be received by every cell in your body and will create a new reality for you. 
Machaca sound can be classified into two groups, principal and subordinate. The principal sound forms are endowed with powers to activate or inhibit the powers of the subordinate sound forms and to make the subordinate sound forms operate and cooperate with them or other subordinate forms. The subordinate Machaca sounds uncoil their powers with the help of the principal forms. Remember that Kundalini is called the coiled power and it is said that she is in the form of the 50 Machaca letters. The subordinate forms are able to exhibit great power when combined with appropriate principal matrica sounds. The controlling mechanism lies mostly in the principal forms. The subordinate forms cannot be successfully combined with each other without the help of the principal forms. Principal sound units are of two kinds, short and long. Short power units inhibit the specific power of a subordinate sound unit at short intervals in order to activate the specific power of another subordinate unit. Long power matrica units are able to activate a subordinate power unit to its limit. The combination of matrica units may be of the short power type, the long power type, or both types. In the short power type, different units operate with short intervals between, and in the long power type, the units operate at longer intervals. The nature of the combination of matrica units determines the nature of the specific sound motion. Matrica units exhibit certain general and specific characteristics. The following are the general characteristics. 1. Matrica units contain three guns, primary attributes. Sattva gun, Rajas gun, Tamas gun. The center of sattva is in bindu, a rajas is in nad, and a tamas is in bija. 2. Matrika units may go beyond gunas when they are reduced to the principle of sound, shabda tanmatra, and become kundalini. 3. Matrika units are endowed with three forms of power, sentience power, willing power, and action power. 4. Matrika units consist of Bindu, Nada, and Bij. 5. Matrika sounds are transformed into five forms of Devata, embodied divine consciousness, at the five Tanmatra levels. The five Devatas are Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra, Isha, and Sada Shiva. 6. Matrika sounds are endowed with five forms of Pranas. They are Prana, Apana, Shamana, Udana, and Vayana. 7. Matrika units constitute four forms of knowledge at four levels. They are A. Highest spiritual knowledge at the sub Bindu level, B. Knowledge of Tanmatras and Mahabhutas, C. Supersensory knowledge, and D. Sensory knowledge. Another important point is the color phenomena of matrika. Color is an indication of the nature of energy predominating in a sound unit. The bija power, when it is in motion, creates a power line which is seen in color. The three fundamental colors are yellow, red, and black. Sattva predominates in yellow, rajas in red, and tamas in black. Yellow indicates that bindu has a greater influence on the bija. Red indicates the greater influence of the nod on the bija, and black shows the power of the bija itself. The original colors are also changed to show the mixed character of the power motion. When the matrika units exhibit creative power, all of them become red at the shahasrara, thousand petaled center level but when they show the power of absorption or when they are going to be absorbed into kundalini they become white that is transparent 
From an evolutionary point of view, whiteness indicates a trace of the finest form of sattva. And from the point of view of absorption, a white matraka is the state where it is reducible to kundalini. At the agnya level, the normally red H becomes white and ksh retains its normal white color. At the vishuddha level, the new matraka H becomes the sound form of the sound tannin, the sound tan matra. The sound form is called the bij of the sound tannin. As a bija of sound tenon, H with Nada Bindu becomes hung and its color is white. All of the matrika units, all 50 of them, are connected with Nad Bindu and give the sound ng except ang and a. Ah. So as a bija of sound tenon, H with Nad Bindu becomes hung and its color is white. In this center, there are 16 matrika units from a ah to a. Ah and all of them are red. At the Anahata level, the matraka yang becomes the bija sound of touch tannin, the touch tan matra, the sense of touch, and is in smoke color, so it retains its original color. It is in this color that yang is reducible to hang. In this center, there are 12 matraka units from k to th, th. They are red. At the Manipur level, the matraka rang becomes the bija sound of the sight tannin, or tan matra, and retains its original red color. There are 10 matraka units in this center, ranging from D to PH, and they are blue in color. At Swadhisthana level, the matraka vang becomes the bija sound of taste tannin. It changes its yellow color to white. In this center, there are six matrika units, which are golden in color. At the Muladhar level, the matrika lang is the beach sound of smell tannin. This matrika sound retains its original yellow color. There are four matrika units in this center. They are of a golden color. When the Shabda Tan Matra, that is, the sound tenon or tan matra, evolves the akash void mahabhuta and sparsha touch tan matra by its sound power. It becomes more specialized. In this sound energy organization, there are 16 matraka units with the central bija hang. In a similar manner, there are 12 matraka units and the central bija yang in the touch energy organization. 10 matraka units and the bija of rang in the sight energy organization, 6 matraka units and the bija of rang in the taste energy organization, and 4 matraka units and the bija lang in the smell energy organization. Neither matraka units nor bijas occur beyond this point. This is the borderland of the madhyama sound. So beyond madhyama, there are no mantras. Matraka has progressively decreased in size. And at the long level, there are only four matrikas. After this, there is nothing. When this point is reached, there is no creation of new principles. The Mahabhutas are combined with each other in a complex manner to form material energy and matter. Shabdatan Matra together with Akash Mahabhuta produce sound energy in the material field, which affects gross sounds. In a similar manner, Sparsha Tan Matra, Rupa Tan Matra, Rasa Tan Matra, and Gandha Tan Matra together with Vayu Mahabhuta, Ap Mahabhuta, and Prithivi Mahabhuta produce respectively the sensory phenomena of touch, sight, taste, and smell in the material field. However, Shabda Tan Matra, the sound tannin, is the only source of sound energy, vibration, which produces all sorts of vibration in the material field only a part of which is audible to the ear. These are Vaikari sounds. They are without Nada Bindu. They have no Nad Bindu. So they are non-mantra sounds. The non-mantra Vaikari sounds cannot go beyond the senso-intellectual consciousness, so they are unable to reach the Tan Matra level. These Vaikari sounds, when arranged in certain forms, become the avenue of the expression of mental ideas. 
It may also be said that non-mantra vaikari sounds are elements which contribute in the formation of aspects of mind which function through the senses and exhibits intellectual, volitional, and affective phenomena. Mantra does not normally occur in the material field. Mantras are formed at the Madhyama level where they exhibit their creative omnipotence under the full control of Ishvara, Supreme Being, in his aspect of supreme powerfulness. On the other hand, mantras retain their basic spiritual power of arousing Kundalini. The mantra sounds are heard at the Shabda Tan Mantra level. Shabda Tan Mantra is all sound, but Shabda Tan Mantra itself has a sound form. It is the Bij Hang. So we see that man is not merely a lump of blocks of material stuff, but rather is an intricate vibratory field of various powers, energy, and consciousness working from within himself to without himself and back endlessly. This relationship between the infinite non-dual power consciousness within ourselves and the subtle vibrational grid produces all the elements of creation and aspects of the human nature. Man is connected to such fields externally and internally to himself endlessly, like drops of dew reflecting one another upon Indra's infinite web. The inner space that we experience is the calm reflecting, mirror-like mind within the midst of the conditions of matter and spirit below and above it. This inner space is the infinite potential consciousness energy, which, as it streams through the infinite points of consciousness, finite points, appears to become separate individual entities. This state of consciousness can be experienced through the release of kundalini by guru's grace a complete practice of yogas and by mantra power mantra mantra is in the nature of kundalini and consciousness it has been stated mantra is in the nature of shiva supreme consciousness and shakti kundalini power mantra arises from the muladhar the root chakra. Those who are able to hear mantra or to expound on it are rare. Yoga Siko Panishad 2-5. Mantra comes into being from Kundalini, who is in Muladhar, who is in the root. Kundalini manifests herself as mantra. As Kundalini is never without Shiva consciousness, so mantra is of the nature of kundalini and consciousness. Mantra is endowed with the power of transforming thinking into deep concentration and causing the life power motion, prana motion, to be absorbed into shushumna. It has been stated, because of the power of concentration, of the conduction of central bioenergy into Shushumna Nadi, of arousing divine consciousness, and of its being based on supreme consciousness, it is called Mantra, Yoga Siku Upanishad 2-7-8. Mantra, which originates from Kundalini in Muladhar, is also called Mool. Mula or basic or root mantra mantra. Mula means root or basis. The mantra which originates directly from Kundalini 
in Muladhar and is the root of all other mantras is called Mula Mantra. So it is stated, that which is the root of all mantras, which arises from Muladhar, and because of the real form of the root that is Kundalini in the subtle nature, is embodied in that Muladhar, it is called Mula Mantra, Yoga Siko Panishad 2 8 9. It has been further stated, through the process of concentration, spiritual protection is effected. This is why it has been termed mantra. In all mantra, in all mantras, power in sound form, vachaka shakti, is inseparably linked with power as consciousness, vachya shakti. In all mantras, power in sound form, vachaka shakti is inseparably linked with power as consciousness, vachya shakti. Ramatapani Upanishad. Therefore, mantra is endowed with the power of protecting the practitioner spiritually through the process of concentration. Thinking develops into concentration by mantra, and this mantra concentration offers spiritual protection. Ishvara said, It is called mantra because deep concentration on the true form of the immensely lustrous devata, embodied divine consciousness, and protection from all fear are affected by it. Kularnwa, chapter 7, page 84. Mantra technically is derived from man and tra. Man means manana, that is concentration, and tra means trana, that is protection. This means that our consciousness becomes free from worldly thoughts and goes into a state of concentration by mantra. Or Man equal manana to mean consciousness and tra to mean protection. That is, as consciousness at the sensory level is multifarious in character, so its higher aspect is hidden. Mantra is that process by which the super consciousness is preserved by controlling the oscillations of consciousness and developing concentration. Mantra is that sound power by which the uncontrolled mind becomes controlled and concentration is established. There is still another factor. In pranava, the final sound power of M mm, is transformed into nada bindu, that is the sound ng and g, on which the effectivity of ong as a mantra depends. Then the mantra sounds and all mantras formed by mantrika are endowed with the ng mm, sound power of nada bindu as an intrinsic part. So all mantrika sounds are like a tetrahedron with bij, nada, and bindu. As ng mm, sound is the inmost constitution of a mantra, and as ng mm, sound has developed from the m mm, factor, so the sound phenomena has been termed mantra, the m factor being used at the beginning of the word. Moreover, the bija sounds of mantra are finally reduced to nada bindu. Therefore, the nad bindu is the vital part of mantra. And as this vital part develops from m, so M has been used as the first letter in mantra. This is why M is called Mantresha, the Lord of Mantra. That is, the super control power of mantra lies in the M. So we find that mantra is that form of power sound which arises from Kundalini first as concentrated uniform single sound, termed Pranava, A-U-M, Aum, which develops as multiform specialized sounds, the matrika, and their complex combinations that can be transformed into waikari, gross vibrations. To put it another way, mantra is the uncoiling of kundalini as sound or vibration power from her subtle state.
So Kundalini has two forms, the subtle luminous form and the mantra form. When the luminous form is aroused in muladhar, Kundalini absorbs mantra. On the other hand, when mantra is aroused, Kundalini manifests herself as a divine being in an appropriate form, Ishta Devata. And that finally leads to luminous form. When Pranava's sound first issued from Supreme Bindu, there was an agitation in Prakriti by which the minus goons embedded there became plus factors. At the sattva point, mantra sound power has created mahanmanas, superconscious mind. And at the tamas point, shabdatan matra, sound cannon, has been created. Pranava develops into 50 matrika sounds, and matrika creates bija, germ mantra. Other forms of mantra and Veda Mantra, the mantra that is the Vedas. Bija Mantra is that form of mantra in which sound power is in great concentration and from which Devata arises. Bija also means seed. The Bija or seed mantra is that form of mantra in which sound power is in great concentration and from which Devata arises. It is that concentrated sound power which makes Kundalini manifest as Devata. Bija mantra may be a simple matrika sound vis a vis. Gang is the bija mantra of the Devata Ganesh. On the other hand, a bija mantra may consist of a combination of two matrika units vis a vis. The bija mantra of the devata Shiva. A bija mantra may be a combination of more than two matrika units. A bija mantra may have more than one bija and one or more sound forms constituted by a number of appro appropriate matrika units without Nada Bindu to increase the power of the bija. In Veda mantra, different matrika units generally without Nada Bindu constitute word forms. That is in the form of the Vedas. Certain word forms are used as mantra, while others present thought knowledge forms, which are received and understood by one who has purified his mind and raised the level of intellection to the spiritual level. Many such minus Nad Bindu word forms are masked forms of matrika units with Nad Bindu. As for example, the word Yama, which means control, is the masked form of the matrika yang. Pranava is the first mantra. It has been stated, what all the Veda declares to be attained, what all asasis is directed towards, and for what thought emotion control is practice, is in brief that sound which is called ong. Ong. ONG is one sound. This ONG is Shabda Brahman and also Supreme Brahman. This spiritual practice is the best and highest. Kato Upanishad. At first, by the practice of the Pranava Mantra, Shabda Brahman is attained. Then the Pranava sound recoils into Kundalini. Thereafter, by deep concentration on luminous Kundalini, Non-sound supreme consciousness is reached. Pranava is a combination of three sounds which arise from A, O, M, A, U, and M. In terms of the human organism, the A can represent the Pingala Nadi, which feeds its solar energy into the creation of the Shtula Sharira, or the physical body. The physical body operates in the state of Jagrat, the conscious awake state. It is in this realm of consciousness and through this body that Vaikhari Vak is manifested. The U is the flow of the Ida Nadi, which 
with its lunar energy, creates and sustained consciousness or mind. This is the Shukshma Sharira, the subtle or psychic body. This body operates in the state of Svapna, the dream state. It is in this realm of consciousness and through this body that the Madhyama walk is manifested. The M vibration creates the Shushumna Nadi and represents the Karna Sharira, which is known in the West as the causal body. This body operates in the state of Shushupti or deep sleep. It is in this realm of consciousness and through this body that the Pashyanti Vak is manifested. Finally, the other Nadi, such as Brahma Nadi, are manifested by the Om after the M, and this is Paravak, the fourth state of consciousness, or Turiya. Pranava is a combination of three sounds which arise from A, O, and M, mm, A, U, and M. As long as A, U, and M form three separate sounds, the yogi will not be able to reach the Shabda Brahman level. Each separated sound does, of course, produce results, but this does not lead to Kundalini. When the three sounds become one sound, it is the Pranava sound as it is manifested in the ong, not the A-U-M, but the ong, O-N-G as one sound. It is an extraordinarily grand sound which contains the germ of the summation of all 50 matrika sounds. It is called Pashyanti sound. When concentration is not deep, the penetration of outer objects into consciousness cannot be completely eliminated. When concentration is interrupted, the one sound appears as three sounds. But in deep concentration, the three sounds become one and inseparable. This is possible when the external, the internal, and their connecting links are under control. This has been termed Bhaya Bhya tan Tantara Madhyama Kriya, external, internal, median process. Prashnopanishad. By the external is meant the outer objects, and by the internal, consciousness, and the middle is their connecting links, the senses. This is the process of senso mental control. At the sensory level, the three sounds are actually two sounds that of a ah and u, a and u. The m sound disappears after the u sound. The a and u sound powers are transformed into Pingala and Ida, nadis or power lines which maintain inspiration and expiration, inhaling and, out and exhaling. The silent ah sound expresses itself as inspiration and the, sil and the silent oo sound as expiration, is inhaling and exhaling. The third m sound disappears at the interval between expiration and inspiration. The a ceases because the Ida flow causes expiration. The U ceases because inspiration is induced by the Pingala flow. So A and U can never be united unless the Pingala flows are transformed. So the A and U can never be united unless the Pingala Ida flows are transformed into Shushumna flow. In Shushumna flow, inspiration and expiration are changed into Kumbhaka, breath suspension. In Shushumna flow, A and U are united to affect O, which is a long sound starting from the Muladhar and passing through the Swadishtana, Manipur, Anahata, Vishuddha, where the genuine O sound is heard. From the Vishuddha, the O passes the Agnya and thereafter the subdued M sound appears as Nada Bindu and becomes linked to O and affects one sound. The one sound now passes the Shashumna and enters the Shahasrara crown chakra, thousand petaled lotus on the top of the head, and is absorbed into Shabda Brahman and Samadhi is attained.
we find that a matrika unit is a specific power operating in its individual characteristic manner. The power line created by the operation of the power is called the specific varna, which is at the same time emitting a specific sound. So, a matrika unit is a specific power in specific sound form. Each matrika unit is a mantra. Each matrika unit is a mantra. Some of these matrika units, when combined in definite manner, create specific sound power in a highly concentrated form. These are the bija mantras, the seed mantras, concentrated powers in sound forms. Other mantras are also created. And finally, the Veda has been created. All spiritual potentials and creative elements contained in the matrika units, for example, the sound K, Kang, gives happiness and prosperity, Gang removes all obstacles and is great, Liring is bewildering, Ring presents charming splendor. Uh, the yang sound is all pervading, etc., etc., etc. Each of the 50 matrikas has a specific power, and all of the spiritual potentials and creative elements contained in the matrika units grow through the Gayatri mantra and culminate in the Veda. So each of the 50 matrikas represents a specific spiritual potential and creative element which grow through the Gayatri Mantra and culminate in the Veda. Here, the arrangements of the Matraka units have taken a characteristic course to form words. And at the same time, they become mostly minus Nara Bindu. So just like the Yang and the Yama, the words are actually minus forms of Nara Bindu. These words appear to be more like a language at the sensory level. The mantra power of Matrika has been transformed in the Veda into a rarefied form of sentience containing the knowledge patterns of both cosmic and spiritual phenomena by specialized letter arrangements. Here, mantra power has lost its specificiality and has changed into cosmic and spiritual knowledge patterns. The real meanings of these knowledge buds cannot be deciphered with the help of mere linguistic knowledge. The highly technical letters and words combinations are only known to the yogis who have realized mantra and its power transformation. Mantra has two forms of power. Vachaka power and Vachya power. Vachaka power is Kundalini in sound form. Kundalini herself is mantra. It is in this power that mantra exists as a vital force. By the mantra process, mantra sounds are reduced to Kundalini power. And then Kundalini assumes the appropriate divine form, Devata, and is revealed to yoga disciples in that form. So mantra sounds can be transformed into kundalini when she appears as devata. When a disciple is able at this stage to transform concentration on the devata form into super concentration and is fully established in it, devata will step by step be recoiled into kundalini and kundalini will be maha kundalini and will shine forth as nirgun completely materially attributeless, pure, supreme consciousness. This is the Vachya power of mantra, Maha Kundalini as Supreme Brahman. If the mantra is a Bija mantra and is imparted by a guru directly to his disciple, it will produce quicker and better results. 
A bij mantra or seed mantra is the depository of immense power in a most concentrated form, which remains latent in it. This latent power is aroused by the mantra process disclosed to the disciple by his guru. The sound aspect of the power gradually becomes more and more rarefied and ultimately is absorbed into Kundalini. At this stage, Kundalini herself assumes the form of Ishta Devata. Ishta Devata is that divine form which arises from the Bija mantra when it is absorbed into Kundalini. When the latent mantra power in the Bija is aroused by the mantra process, the sound is absorbed at a certain stage of concentration into Kundalini, and Kundalini manifests herself as the Devata linked to the Bija. So Ishta Devata is the divine form of mantra. Ishta Devata is the manifest Kundalini power in form. This divine form is intrinsically related to the Bija, the seed. Bija is a Devata. Bija is a Devata. Bija is a Devata, or deity, a demigod, a god, is a multifaceted concept in Sanatan Dharma, that is, Hinduism or the Vedic tradition. There are very many different aspects of this word, Devata. Apart from an object of worship, Devata is a symbol representing different things in different forms of knowledge. Devata represents a faculty of higher consciousness. Consorts represent the associate consciousness powers of Devata that are inseparable from the Devata. For instance, Shakti is the consort of Shiva and she is his power. Or Radha is the consort of Krishna and she is his Shakti. Weapons and vehicles represent powers, instruments, and methods that enables one to reach the Devata. Different forms of Devata are said to reside in or rule different worlds. Though Devatas pervade all the worlds, we usually apply the word Devata in the seven Urdha Lokas, ranging especially from Svarga Loka and above. Also, in the worship of each Devata, the Devata is equated to the Virat Purusha, the universal form of Krishna, the Lord Himself. It is said that the word Deva applies up to Paramatma. That is, each Devata is not only a part of, but also represents the whole of the Eternal. Devata is both universal and personal. Devata is said to grow when man worships. This is the personal aspect. The growth of Devata in man is the development and fulfillment of man's being, material, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. Sri Krishna says, Devan bhavayantena te deva bhavayantu va parashparam bhavayanta shreya param avapshyata. Gods grow when men worship and please them. They in turn bring about men's well-being. Thus they mutually help each other. Devata is also representative of some power in nature. The sound form of each Devata's energy is represented by a mantra. Mantras are of many types like Shtri and Purusha mantras. They have waking and sleeping times. Each mantra Devata represents a Nadi 
and the inactive and active times of those are represented by this. Each devata also represents a star or constellation in the sky. The consort's vehicle symbols on a flag can also be seen in this light. The star closest to another star is depicted as an adornment or consort. If a star while rising is followed by another, the latter is said to be the vehicle. A devata killing an asura is an astronomical symbolism as well too. If character A is said to kill character B, it means that the star symbolized by B sets at the time when the star symbolized by A rises. If there's an indirect killing, then it means that these stars are not diametrically opposed, but there is a small time difference between the rise of A and the set of B. In general, enmity is seen as diametrical oppositeness. At the time of the set of B, the star nearest to A is said to have helped A in killing B. Indra killing Vritra, Rama killing Ravan, Arjuna hitting Bhishma with the help of Shikandi, and between, enmity between Garuda and Sharpa are all examples. Devas are demigods, the luminous kundalini forms of vibrations which are essential to the substratum of existence and consciousness itself, are imbued with near limitless power based on their Nad Bindu relationship to the Supreme God. Based on the tendencies of the God himself, an infinite array of eternal life has been birthed. It is said that the spiritual world makes up three quarters of the total reality, and the material world only one quarter. So these devic beings, eternally cognizant blissful servants of the divine, watchers and keepers of worlds, act as though they were an organ on the body of the Supreme God and through them all of us are connected to his power. Without the demigod Surya, the sun for example, we would be void of his life-giving pranic energy, among other things. The same goes for all other various demigods, which have not only formed the elemental composition of the planet, but have formed the elemental composition of our own body as well. All of these forces are one pulsing heartbeat, one streaming alm vibration, evolving through the Gayatri Mantra and culminating in the Veda. Devata in its divine form is a form which Kundalini herself has assumed. It is the form which arises from the Bija Mantra in deep concentration, mantra sounds are recoiled into Kundalini and Kundalini appears as Ishta Devata. In the sound process, concentration gradually becomes uninterrupted and deep. In this manner, holding concentration is transformed into deep concentration. At a higher stage of deep concentration, Ishta Devata arises from mantra. Ishta Devata is not a passive phenomenon. Ishta Devata becomes living when concentration reaches the state of Samadhi. When this superconscious concentration is fully established, Ishta Devata is seen also in a deconcentrated state. The devotee, who is in the Devata consciousness, sees, hears, and feels Ishta Devata in a post concentration state and is absorbed into that divine form in concentration. There is another unusual factor in relation to Bij Mantra. When a yoga disciple first ascends to non-mental supreme concentration, he is unable to stay there and descends. When the ups and downs go on and on again, Maha Kundalini, who is one with Parma Shiva, supreme consciousness, exhibits her supreme spiritual creativity. Unlike the creativity of Prana by which the universe has been evolved, 
Maha Kundalini, masking everything that is not consciousness and only being in consciousness, manifests herself through Supreme Nod and Supreme Bindu as Bij Mantra and Ishta Devata at Sahasrara level. Bija Mantra arises from the Supreme Nod aspect of Maha Kundalini and from the Supreme Bindu aspect. At one point, Bija Mantra becomes Ishta Devata, and at another point, Ishta Devata becomes Bija Mantra. It is Maha Kundalini who shows her two aspects, Bija Mantra and Ishta Devata. There is no difference between Bija Mantra and Ishta Devata. The disciple at the Shahasrara level through Bija Mantra develops deepest concentration in which the entire consciousness is of Ishta Devata. When concentration is less deep, mantra sound is heard, and mantra sound makes concentration deeper. And at a certain point, it is transformed into Ishta Devata when concentration becomes deepest. In this manner, superconscious concentration becomes established in the disciple. He gradually becomes the master. Then it becomes easier for him to pass through Supreme Bindu and Supreme Na to Maha Kundalini in her supreme spiritual aspect to attain stable non-mental supreme concentration or dhyana. There are two power flows in mantra. One is the prana flow, and the other is the kundalini flow. Kundalini exercises control over prana, both partially and completely. In partial control, the general creative activities of prana are retained and the pranic energy is utilized in exhibiting superpowers. When prana is fully controlled, Spiritual power arises in mantra by which Kundalini is aroused and her spiritual yoga power is released. This causes the absorption of all creative principles. So in mantra lie both spiritual yoga and vibhuti, superpower. In one aspect, mantra is a means to acquire superpowers. In another aspect, mantra leads to spiritual yoga or union. This is why it has been stated, quote unquote, when the principle of mantra is known, a person becomes freed alive and attains animan power. That is, the power of transforming the material body into the subtle body and other superpowers. Yoga Sutra Upanishad. And so, we have seen that all the various multiform manifestations of the cosmos, the human beings and animals, and the spirit worlds of gods, are all holographic fractal extensions of the original Supreme God, Narayan, Bhagavan Sri Krishna, and are contained within his all-expansive vibrational power field. Each unit of consciousness represents a holographic connection and a representation of the whole meaning that the macrocosm and microcosm bear a causal relationship with one another and affect one another by means of various emanations radiating centripetally and centrifugally from the center to the periphery and vice versa. This unified power consciousness field is essentially one, yet infinitely diverse, and its potential is limited only by itself. Through entanglement with the material nature by our own mental choices, the power grid arranges for us to become ensnared in the material energy in a relationship of devolution, contraction from spirit to matter, and of all things opposed to the expansive bliss of the reverse condition, whereby, through the agency of the consciousness, the mind and all lower creative principles are absorbed into the Kundalini and Supermind and that into Supreme Consciousness Power. Across the board, when we are in the negative polarized condition, we reap negative consequences in the lives of ourselves and in those around us. 
and cause more entanglement in material karma. Whereas, in the positive spiritual polarized condition, just the opposite is true. Gradually, we can be pulled down to hell in a maelstrom of our own chaos, or raised up to the highest sublime states of nirvana in heaven. The choice is ours, where the infinite potential power is placed directly into our hands. But surely, the choice is either up or down. There is no in-between.